Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you all for being here. I am John Brock, and I get to uh, lead us in our, in our uh, discussion this morning on the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, a great and, oh, excuse me, a great and wonderful chapter. Um, I just want to, to uh, do a brief little synopsis. Uh, I'm sure that, that Pastor Jack did a great job last week in, in introducing us to Ephesians, but since I don't know for sure what all he said, I'm going to probably um, repeat a few things. Um, but Paul is writing this letter to the Ephesians. Ephesus is on the eastern shore of the Aegean. I'm sure that all of you have that part of the world memorized in a map in your heads. But if you think of, you, you probably know approximately where Israel is. If you go up a few hundred miles north, that's about where um, uh, Ephesus is. It's, it's a trade city. It was a port city. It was also one of those cities that was on the main lot, one of the main roads that Rome had put in. It's on a trading route. Uh, so it's a, um, it's a cosmopolitan city. It's a multicultural city. It is far, but it is part of the Roman Empire, but it's been more influenced by, since it's closer physically to Greece. Um, it is far more uh, Greek influence than it is Roman influence. Uh, but that simply means that, um, uh, that, 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 that they would be more likely to worship the Greek versions of the gods rather than the Roman versions of the gods. But there is a significant uh, Jewish congregation there, uh, Jewish both, uh, uh, I mean, and Jew, a Jewish congregation and a congregation of Christians that was probably begun by the Jewish believers who have chosen to follow Christ. Um, the congregation, the Christian congregation, though, is made up of both kind of believers. We have the Jewish Christians, because of course that, you know, Judaism, Jesus was a Jew, that's where Christianity comes from. Uh, but then we also have the Gentile believers who have come to believe in Jesus uh, for uh, not because of their own Jewish background, but for whatever other reasons they might. Um, this letter was written probably around 60 AD, somewhere in that area. Um, and <clears throat> depending upon what biblical scholar you talk to, um, some say it was written very specifically to the church in Ephesus. Others say, well, no, it's more likely because of it's, it's so general in so much of the body of the letter that it was probably what we call a, a, a um, uh, encyclical, meaning that it was a letter that... Um, We've all received an encyclical letter of some kind. We've just not been aware of it. When you can tell, it's basically a form letter that they just inserted your name into it. That's, that's there <coughs> Bible scholars who say that that's what this was really, it was really that kind of a letter um, that was meant to be read to the congregation, but that it was also meant to, the letter itself was meant to travel around to the different churches in that whole area. Um, to me, that's not necessarily important one way or the other. I say that just so that we, if there seems to be times when, well, no, I shouldn't put it that way. I, I say that more because as we look at this letter, it does seem to be more along the lines of just laying out some basic um, groundwork, some, some foundational theology uh, for the church and for, for Christianity in general. And so it does make a little bit of sense to me that it might be, that the original intent of the letter might have been to go around to a whole bunch of other congregations. But again, that doesn't take away one way or the other from the letter itself. So that was a quick little recap of, of opening to the letter. <clears throat> so um, we get into... We get into Ephesians chapter 2. Now, hopefully, all of us know of at least one verse from Ephesians chapter 2, whether or not we necessarily know that it came from Ephesians chapter 2. But we'll, we'll get to that in, in just a little bit. So we start off with chapter 2. Uh, and, and Paul writes, You were dead through the... And I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. 
Um, you were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived, following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. So I'm going to stop as we go along and, and point out many and various things. Uh, I do, one of the things I find interesting, especially in a letter like Ephesians, uh, which was probably written toward the end of Paul's career, is that he tends to get lengthier and he has a lot of run-on sentences. And so we, we see it here that uh, those first two verses are one sentence. We'll, um, there are other places in particular, you, uh, hopefully Pastor Jack pointed out last week, that like the first 14 verses of chapter 1 were one honking long sentence. Um, so, um, uh, but... <clears throat> um, some things that are interesting here. Ruler of the power of the air. That's probably a reference to, um, um, to, <clears throat> to Satan, um, the devil, whatever we want to, to, to call that. Uh, being, um, Satan is, has long been uh, identified as, as being um, uh, a spirit of wind of, of in, in the... Um, uh, in, in the heavens, um, but it's, it's also um, interesting to me that uh, th this, this whole, so, so the, I have trouble talking in a linear sense, and I keep jumping back on myself, and I'm really sorry about that. So this whole, this whole first section, these, these first several verses are, are focusing on sin. Then we'll, we'll take a little break, and then it will focus on the last several verses, uh, like 7 through 10, that are going to focus on salvation. So here in this opening, in these opening three verses with this, with this um, the following the ruler of the power of air. So he's, he's um, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. So he's trying to give uh, not necessarily an out to people for, for messing up, but he's saying that, yeah, we understand that, that you know, evil exists and that we will, we will fail and we will, uh, we will not always follow uh, what, what God calls us to, how, how Christ wants us to live. As in verse 3, you know, all of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of our flesh and senses, and we were by nature children of wrath like everyone else. So saying that before we, uh, before we came to faith, we were this um, almost uncontrolled child, you know, children of wrath, um, following our senses and flesh, um, hedonistic almost. Now, again, I need to point out that he's writing to a congregation that is made up of both Jewish believers and Gentile believers, and that's going to be a little bit important here in, in a bit. But we need to also comprehend that this, this Jewish idea of, of um, Gentile, um, the, the Greek word for Gentile is um, uh, hithane, hithane. I, I, I didn't look this up, and I, and I should have followed the entomology, but it sounds to me like that's the word that um, in English would have been translated heathen. So, and when we think of the term heathen, what do we think of? We think of, you know, those who are uncontrolled, those who, who don't follow. I mean, the very, the very definition of heathen is someone who doesn't follow your God. Um, and so... Paul is using this language uh, to say, you know, well, look at look at those, you know, look at look at the the way that that we used to live before we came to faith. Now he's he's so this part portion might be directed at the Gentile believers, but it might also be point, you know, be be applicable to the Jewish believers who, who say, well, yeah, you know, um, be, before we as a people came to be to faith, that was the way that we lived. But now, since we have the promise of Abraham, of course, you know, remember our, our whole summer series, the, the promise of Abraham, I will be your God, you will be my people, your descendants shall outnumber the stars in the sky. And so all 
through the, the, the centuries, the people, uh, so many of the Jewish people have depended upon the fact that, you know, well, Abraham was lifted up, so the rest of us are kind of, uh, were blessed through Abraham, could be referring to their time before Abraham, but it's more likely um, more aimed at, 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 the, uh, at the Gentile believers. So, uh, the first three verses, we're focusing on sin. Verse 4, But God, who is rich in mercy, out of great love which, with which he loved us, even when we were dead through tras our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. So that's, so start off focusing on sin. Now he's coming into this next little section, verses uh, to remind us that, um, you know, we're not lost. Not everything is lost. You know, um, in the ages to come, we're being going to be shown this immeasurable riches of grace and kindness toward Jesus Christ. So then we get into verse 8, one of my favorite verses in all of Scripture. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the results of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. So we've got some amazing things here. Of course, this is, this is the verse that, that Luther stumbles upon and, and that, well, I shouldn't say stumbles upon, but that, that, that Luther, when he reads and, and he really starts to study, he starts to comprehend that it doesn't matter what we do because our works aren't going to do anything. Um, and, and, and that then helps him begin to develop uh, his, his, his uh, theses against or, or for the, for the um, correction of the, the Christian church of his day, what, uh, the, the Western Christian church. Uh, because, of course, in Luther's day, the, 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 the church was very much into um, you have to do things, right? You have to, you have to go to confession. You have to go to mass. Uh, you, you have to... Uh, you know, say certain prayers at, at certain times of, of the day. Um, and, and Luther says, wait, that's, that's not what this verse says. For by grace you have been saved through faith. So <clears throat> it gives us, excuse me, a few other things here. Um, we've been saved by grace through faith, not of our own doing. So reminding us that, that, there, that this isn't us. We can't claim the um, uh, we we can't claim to have been saved by by anything that we have done. It's a gift from God, not the results of work, so that no one may boast. And, and unfortunately, to, to me, I think even us in in our present day Lutheran church, we tend to ignore verse nine, or we tend not ignore it, but we tend to skip over it. We just we really focus on we have been saved by grace through faith, and then we forget about the not by works, um, because we, we still, don't we, we still tend to have this emphasis on, on works. <coughs> Excuse me, but then, then in verse 10, it almost sounds like in verse 10, like he negates what he just said, for we are what he has made us in created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. It almost sounds like he's saying, well, we need to do those good works because, you know, that's what we're created for. And that's, no, <laughs> that, that's not the way it works. Um, that uh, what, what, I think what the point he is trying to be made or that he is trying to make here is we are indeed saved by grace. There's nothing that we can do about it. But therefore, we are called to do those good works. The works themselves are not going to save us. Um, 
so that um, uh, you know God wants us to you know um, help out at at uh, at, a, at a shelter. God wants us to uh, make sure that people have enough to eat, um, things of that nature. But doing those things in and of themselves are not going to bring us salvation, because salvation, God's gift or God's grace comes to us as a gift. However, we're called to do those things just because of that gift of grace, that we are called um, um, to, to live out that righteous life, that, that um, live with a transformed heart, as has been said, um, that... Uh, um, that that's the way that that uh, that we can be a witness of our faith to the world without using words. Um, now, the next part, or, or yeah, the second part of that that verse, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life, almost sounds like um, you know we don't have a choice in the matter. Uh, there would be those who argue, well, that's, that's, an, uh, that's an example of predestination. So, you know, of course we're going to do good works because God has already decided that we're going to do works and there's nothing that I can do to change that. And uh, no, that's not, <laughs> that, that, that I would argue, no, that's not correct. That, um, uh, where's 65? Um, that we are um, called to, we are saved by faith, but it is because of our faith that we are called then to do good works. But just because we are saved and are called to do good works, that does not mean that we don't have a choice in doing those good works. Um, in this, 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 this whole idea of, of predestination um, that that um, I I would argue that um, th this is from the uh, commentary Ephesians by Thomas Slater, um, and he says the writer believes that God has planned the future, but we are still responsible for putting that plan into action. In this way, Ephesians attempts to avoid the tension between the predestined actions and human responsibility. Or I like to 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 uh, put it that you know, God God is omniscient, right? God is omniscient. God is uh, omnipotent. God is everywhere, knows everything. But just because God knows something and God knows what we are going to do, doesn't necessarily mean that God is causing that to happen. And the example that that I that I have used in the past is when when my boys were little, and. Um, uh, I would be making dinner, um, you know, be cooking something on the stove. My, especially my older son Benjamin was always wanting to know what's 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 going on there in the stove. What are you doing up there, Dad? And so he would be trying to reach up to to touch, you know, to pull himself up or see what's up there. And Benjamin, don't do that. You know, it's hot. You're going to hurt yourself. And you know, I, I would stop him from doing that. And I knew. That if I turn around to do something on the other side of the sink, because the stove's over here and my back's toward Benjamin, that Benjamin may well reach up and touch the stove. Now, I am not, I, I know that he's going to do that if I, if, I, if I turn in this direction, but I am not making him do that. I am not predetermining that he is reaching up to touch the top of the hot stove. That, to me, that's, that's similar to the way that um, just because God knows the decisions that I'm going to make. God can see all of the different... Um, I need to remember to stay in the light. Uh, God can see all of the different choices, or, or, or no, what do I want to say? All of the, the consequences if I choose to do something different. But God also knows out of all of those choices which one I am going to take, which one might be the best for me, which is not necessarily <clears throat> the choice that I'm going to make. But just because God knows what I'm going to choose doesn't mean that that's the one 
that God is trying, that, that, that is best for me, and that doesn't mean that that's the one that God has said, okay, John, you're going to, you know, you're going to choose to, uh, to do A instead of B, even though B would be the better one. I'm, you're going to choose A, and you're going to have problems with A. God doesn't necessarily um, take away from us that choice. Just because God knows what we're going to do doesn't mean that we don't have a choice. Did I explain that? No. <laughs> okay. Um, ah, I don't. I don't. Um, that that. Um, okay. Well, here. Let me let me read this other part. Um, there is an inherent tension between determinism and predestination and human responsibility. If every action is predetermined, how can anyone be held accountable for his or her actions? If every action is predestined, why should we pray intercessory prayers? If every action is predestined, why is there such an emphasis on having faith if human events are inevitable? Through time, <clears throat> several attempts have been made to keep the balance between God's sovereignty and human responsibility. Some have argued that omnipotence actually means that God is the greatest power and that no combination of powers can overcome God. Thus, evil powers have limited influence and humans can be held responsible for immoral choices. Others have argued that God wants to save everyone, but God allows us the freedom to choose our actions. However, the end is unavoidable. So, <clears throat> probably... Probably I shouldn't have opened that can of worms, but since I have, <laughs> I, will, I will try to, um, to, to, to close it by saying that from, from a Lutheran point of view, we say that <clears throat> um, we do indeed have free will, that we can choose, um, we can, we can, that, that we can choose. Um, we are not um, predetermined to go to heaven or hell, um, because within predestination, the the main way that it works, I, well, that's not quite the way to say it. The, the 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 ideology behind predestination is that um, God chooses Bert, and Bert's going to be among the saved, and God looks at Jeff, and Jeff's among the damned. Okay, so it doesn't matter. I'm, you guys are sitting up front. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's what you're the, so um, it doesn't matter what they do or how they live or what they believe. Bert's going to go to heaven. Jeff's going to go to hell. Um, now, a believer in predestination will say that, well, because Bert is predestined to go to heaven, she, of course, is going to live a life of faith. She is going to live a life of service to others. And because Jeff is, is predestined to go to hell, he is going to um, live a life of debauchery and, and recklessness and, you know, basically what, the way he's lived most of the time. I'm teasing. <laughs> but, um, but that, um, uh, so it doesn't, it doesn't matter how we live, what we do, we cannot affect um, the outcome of the heaven or hell, which verse 8 would support we are saved by grace through faith, not by works. But the, 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 the flip side of that whole idea of predestination is, you know, what if Bert chooses to ignore that little voice of God and Bert lives the life of debauchery and Jeff chooses to fight against that impulse his whole life of, of being awful and does go to church and, and you know, feeds the hungry. Predestination says, mm, you're, you're going to, that it doesn't matter. Bert's going to go to heaven. Jeff's going to go to hell. Lutherans would say, because, because we don't agree with that understanding of predestination, that... Um, not that works are going to save us, but that um, the way we live our lives basically does indeed show show our hearts, show the um, 
uh, show God at work in us so that um, God in our lives, um, that, that faith in our lives is going to uh, cause us to, to or, or urge us to be a witness of God's grace and love to all those around us. And it is not up to us whether or not, or yeah, whether or not we, we go to heaven or hell, it's not up to us. Um, it's not up to the way that we live, but it's also, again, God has seen how we're going to live and God is not sending us to hell. A Lutheran idea or Lutheran understanding is that we would send ourselves to hell in as much as when we read something like the book of Revelation. And we see in Revelation again and again throughout, throughout that, those 21 chapters how God continually opens up arms and says, come to me, anyone, everyone who believes. And the only beings throughout the book that do, are, that do not go to God are those who are actively turning their backs to God. So, this is John Brock. I don't know that this is all of Lutheranism. I, John Brock, would say that, um, like I said, we, we send ourselves to hell and that the, that, um, the only, um, and, the, and, and, and that God, God knows what we're going to do, doesn't necessarily make God I mean, it doesn't necessarily mean that God is causing us to do those things, but God knows what we're going to do, how we're going to live our lives. And that's probably the best that I can explain that right now. <laughs> um, so let's move on to the next section, um, verses 11 to 22. Um, and so this next section then talks... Uh, now we get into a little bit more of the, the understanding of the fact that the, the Christian church in general, and in this time, in the first century, the Christian church is being made up of believers from a Jewish background and believers from a Gentile background. We need to understand as well that um, the, the Gentile, from a, a Jewish point of view, from excuse me, of, of, of Gentiles is, um, is not positive. Uh, Gentiles are, um, well, okay, there, there's the, the, the first, um, the very, very obvious difference between Jewish uh, believers and Gentile believers is that, uh, <clears throat> especially among males, the males had to undergo a, a Jewish believer um, or person who grew up in a Jewish household and became a believer of Jesus. The male was already circumcised. So um, within, the, uh, within the Christian church for uh, several decades, there was debate of if a male converts from, if a Gentile converts to Christianity, does that male Gentile need to be circumcised. And the overall outcome of, of several decades of debate is that no, the Gentile male, if they become a believer, do not need to be circumcised. Um, but that's, that term, circumcision or uncircumcision, is one that is used within the community, um, not only the Jewish community, but the, the Christian community, as um, uh, uh, a, a, a physical designation of, of seeing who is a, of literally seeing of who is a believer and who is not a believer. And, you know, again, the reason that I brought up the Greek influence in Ephesus is that um, first century in Greek, they, they have a much more relaxed approach to um, lack of clothing on people. 
nudity than than what the United our our 21st century mores in North America do. So that's to go, you know, and there were the there would be the public baths, so that you would go to the public bath and and you would be naked, and it would be very easy to 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 just look around and see who has been circumcised and who is not. Um, so that's. Um, uh, we, we, need, we need to be aware of that aspect of it so that when they're talking about circumcision and uncircumcision, it is indeed something that they, as a, as a whole, um, can readily determine. Um, so, verse 11. So then, remember that at one time you Gentiles by birth called the uncircumcision uh, by those who were called the circumcision, a physical circumcision made in flat the flesh by human hands, remember that you were at that time without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. So, so he's, you know, he, he's using a bunch of um, very strong language here of... of um, trying to, to remind the Gentile believers that from a Jewish point of view, they were very much put apart. You know, now we need to, to bear in mind from the Jewish point of view, when we, especially when we read the Jewish scriptures, we see how over and over again the law of Moses <clears throat> is calling them, to, is calling the Jewish people to basically... Um, uh, Become. I was going to use the word xenophobic, and that's uh, that's too strong of a word. But they but they close their ranks. They're not supposed to um, mingle, at least not marriage wise, to mingle with uh, folks of of other nations. They can trade, but they're not really. You know, they're, they they need to be careful that they don't um, accept the customs of another country, that they don't accept the gods of another country, that you don't marry into. The, the 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 peoples of the, that other country, um, and so this this idea of foreigner, of alien, of stranger, you know, the, that is being seen as the other, um, and we 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 get that emphasis here in, in verses eleven and twelve. How remember uh, that you were at that time without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. And remember the, the covenant that I mentioned a little bit ago. You are, I will be your God, you will be my people. Um, but 13, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So he's pointing out the, the, the simple fact that they were far off, so they, 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 were, they were out of the picture. They, they weren't anywhere far, even close by because of what Jesus does on the cross. The blood of Christ on the cross, um, they are now been able to be brought into, he doesn't, he doesn't use the word covenant, but, but I would say that they've been now brought into the covenant. Verse 14, for he, Christ, for Christ is our peace, in his flesh he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall that is the hostility between us. The dividing wall. Now the dividing wall could be, it could be a reference to several things. Um, again, something we need to remember that in the temple in Jerusalem, this, this was written in six, somewhere around 60 A.D. Um, it's not until 70 A.D. that the Romans come in when the, when the Jewish people revolt against the Roman Empire, and Vespian comes in and he raises all of Jerusalem and the temple is destroyed. At 60 AD, it is, the temple is still intact, and they do, the, 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 the Jewish faith does make um, um, accommodations for Gentiles who have converted to Judaism. Now, it's not something that they, that they do on a regular basis. They don't do... Uh, the, the Jewish faith doesn't go out and proselytize. They don't, they don't try to make converts. But should someone want to become Jewish, if they're coming at it from 
a, a Gentile background, they, they can indeed become Jewish. They can go to the temple. However, in the temple, there is a literal wall that will separate the, the ethnic Jews from the Gentile converts. So there is a physical wall that separates them so that they cannot, in worship, intermingle. So is Paul talking about that physical dividing wall? Um, possibly. Uh, but also the fact you know, that there, there's, there's, there are some other reasons, like um, the, the whole fact that that um, not the yeah that 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 we have this this um, long-standing um, um, not 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 feud alienation we have this long-standing alienation between ethnic Jews and and Gentiles. Here's some here's a total aside that that I've only relatively recently found out. So I we did I I, I did the DNA test. Have you guys have done the Ancestry.com and. My, my, my maternal grandmother came from Finland. My maternal grandfather came from Italy. Um, my father was born and raised in North Carolina. I used to tell people that I was a quarter Finnish, a quarter Italian, and half Southern. Um, but I found out through, through the Ancestry.com that on my maternal grandmother's side, I'm indeed Finnish. I'm primarily Finnish from that. But I'm also 8% European Jewish. Don't really know quite what that means, but um, um, I found it interesting that all my life I've, I've thought I'm this one thing, and then I found out, oh, hey, hey, I have a whole bunch of these other little things here, one of which is actually, to me at least, somewhat fairly significant in my faith. Um, which is not to say that I have any special standing with Jewish people today, but just found it interesting. You didn't need to know that. But thanks for letting me share. So, um, um, physical the, the wall, uh, the, the 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 divider um, could be the physical wall. Could be that spiritual wall between Jews and Gentiles. It could it could be referring to the law, like I said a few moments ago, the the law that very much separates um, uh, or, or wants the Jewish people to separate themselves. From all other people, so we're not exactly sure um, which, you know, what he is referring to. But but I think that we, we can all agree that there w would be indeed some type of divider. He's probably not caught referring to the physical wall, but he's probably talking about either the spiritual wall or the moral uh, law of Moses wall. That has, that has caused that hostility between us. Another example of that hostility, so the law of Moses, um, the, right, it, remember, you know, dietary restrictions. And so um, another big debate that went along with the circumcision debate was do non-Jewish Christians have to follow the dietary law? And it wasn't until the Apostle Peter in, in the book of Acts, we read about it. The Apostle Peter has a vision that all food is now acceptable, that, um, that that whole concept of the dietary laws, whether or not you have to follow them, that that um, gets get tossed out. Because uh, in, 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 in his vision, Peter, has, he's praying, and this, this um, cloth comes down, and it's filled with all kinds of food and animals, uh, both kosher and non-kosher, and, and the voice says to him, go and eat. And it takes three times of this vision, but Peter finally understands this is God telling him that all food is now acceptable. So it's now acceptable to eat all of the various foods, but even more so than it means that Jewish Christians are allowed to eat with Gentile Christians because now they can eat the same food. Unfortunately, it takes a while for the church to catch on with that as well. But that, th that concept, too, might be a reference to this whole dividing wall that's causing the hostility between us. Verse 15, 
He, again, Christ. Christ has abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself one new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace, and might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross, thus putting to death that hostility through it. All right. Remember what Jesus is asked at one point, um, uh, what's the greatest commandment of all? And what does he say? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. He said those supersede all the law of Moses. That, that's the Brock prayer phrase. But um, that, uh, so verse 15, he has abolished the law and its commandments and ordinances to create in himself one new people. So Paul is emphasizing that ethnic heritage, circumcision, whether or not we follow dietary laws, that's not important. What is important is what Jesus did on the cross. Uh, you know, um, so that both groups in God, to God in one body through the cross, thus putting death to that hostility. So here he, he's... Again, he's trying. He, he's laying some groundwork for um, for the church as a whole to have the church as a whole understand that um, ethnicity isn't important. Um, uh, the 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 circumcision is not important. None of that matters because what Christ did. You know, John three sixteen. For God so loved. Who did God, you know, God so loved the small Jewish community? No. God so loved, you know, this weird backwater area of the Roman Empire? No. God so loved, um, you know, who, whichever group you want to point out? No. God loved the world that Jesus was sent, and he died on the cross for all of us. Verse 17. So, Christ came and proclaimed peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. Again, he's, he's using that, that imagery, but those who are far off, who were the ones who were far off? Those were the Gentiles. Those who were near, those are the Jewish people. He proclaimed peace to both groups. Proclaimed peace to both groups. Um, for through him, both of us have access in one spirit to the Father. All right, and again, now this is not, <coughs> excuse me, um, this is not explicitly um, talking about the Trinity, and hopefully um, you're, you're aware that the, the concept of Trinity as such is never explicitly stated in Scripture, but here is one of those examples that, that we say that this is why we as Christians understand and talk about God as Trinity because it's Christ came so that we might have access to one spirit in the Father. So we get Father, Son, and Spirit all referenced here in this one verse, or these two verses. Um, so then, <clears throat> you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the, with the saints and also members of the household of God built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. So, yeah, the, the um, um, talking about laying the foundation, here he very explicitly almost gives us that, um, gives that, us that, that vision of talking about Christ as a cornerstone. Um, and it's, it's actually not the only place in Scripture that we talk about Christ being the cornerstone. Um, but... Um, at least I, um, if I got that right, um, that, <clears throat> um, yeah, um, the idea of um, trying to bring everybody together. Um, now, again, this is at a time um, when, uh, if if you know much about the early church, you or the church before it became legal. Uh, a guy named Constantine in around 300 A.D. legalized Christianity. When he became emperor, he cr legalized Christianity. Uh, but up until then, Christianity was seen 
as illegal. Um, and illegal because um, the Christians refused to not only worship the, the Roman gods, but they were therefore then refused to worship the emperor. The, the Jewish people were able to um, avoid worshiping the emperor by um, the Jewish leaders had worked out with the Roman government decades before that they literally paid a specific tax so that they didn't have to worship the emperor. The Christians, these followers of Jesus, were seen as a sect, a breakoff group from the Jewish people, and so they were not covered by that same tax. <coughs> excuse me, by that same tax, and so therefore, um, they were required to worship the emperor, which of course they wouldn't do. So if, if you um, uh, read much about the life of, of Christianity in the first several, or the first three millennia, or not millennia, the first, uh, um, the first 300 years or so, um, there were times of persecution to the church. As a matter of fact, um, Emperor Nero, who was um, around 50 AD, uh, there are reports. Now, we also have to remember that the history was written by the people who won, and Nero was not a very popular guy, but there are reports um, from the historians that when Nero was in power um, and that he used a bunch of the the Roman money to build lavish gardens around um, his estate, and that at night he would light them up by making these huge bon bonfires, at the center of which would be Christians tied to a stake covered in tar. Um, so Christians were persecuted uh, for their faith, um, uh, but uh, and there was a point that I was telling that I was going to make about using that example, <laughs> and it went out of my mind. Um, but that, that, um, um, that to be a Christian is not necessarily an easy thing in the first century or even the second century. Um, they didn't always face persecution, but sometimes they did. But what, what here we have Paul trying to show that um, it doesn't matter. So even if Christians were of Jewish background, if they were Christian, they were no longer covered under that tax. So they would be, um, they would be persecuted as well. But Paul, here Paul's trying to say it doesn't matter what our ethnic background is. It doesn't matter what, you know, where our DNA might come from. All of us, all of us are in this together now. Christ did it for all of us. Um, and built upon, uh, we are no longer strangers and aliens, but are citizens and saints and also members of the household of God. Uh, so the closing couple of verses of chapter 2, in him the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. So again, Paul's trying to, to, to emphasize the fact that, that um, the background, individual backgrounds don't matter. Individuals... Uh, Ethnicity, uh, how you were raised, what you were, what you believed growing up, doesn't matter. What's important is the salvation that you have now. And it's interesting to me that that Paul indeed is—he's not talking about salvation in a future tense. He's talking about the salvation now, so that we are saved by grace through faith. Not we will be saved by grace, but we are saved by grace through faith. So to Paul, the, the faith is very much present, grace is very much um, in the present, and that it applies to all of us, no matter what our backgrounds are, no matter where we came from, no matter what we were before, now that we are proclaiming and believers of Christ, that we are all one family. All right, so... That's what I have for us from, for Ephesians chapter 2 today. So I want to thank you all for taking part, and I hope you have a good day.